Hello, ladies and gentlemen out there on the interwebs. My name is James Muro, and welcome to the James Muro Literary Podcast. Um, I'm really excited today because we'll be chatting uh, crime fiction, and uh, and I'll be chatting with um, uh, Melanie Raba. It's Raba. Yes, Raba. Yeah. Raba and Mukoma Guge. That's easy for me to pronounce. Um, so. For those of you who are live uh, or who are, who are watching us now, who will watch us later, I'll, what I'll do is I'll read uh, the profiles, a bit of the profiles of this lady and gentleman. They are really accomplished, so I can't read everything, but I'll read the, the, the vital information. Melanie Raba is a German author and podcaster. She debuted, she debuted with psychological thriller The Trap in 2015, followed by Stranger 2016 and The Shadow 2018 and The Woods 2020. 20, 2018 and 2019. Her first work of fiction came out in 2020, and in 2021, she published her first literary novel in Germany. Her work is published in more than 20 countries, and she lives in Cologne. So you're you're tuning in from Cologne, right? That's right. Thank you. Uh, Mokoma Aguge is an associate professor of literatures in English at Cornell University and the author of numerous, numerous titles, including Unbury a Dead with Song, The Rise of the African Novel, uh, Black Star Nairobi, Nairobi Heat, uh, Poetry Collections Logotherapy, and Hurling Words of Consciousness. And, um, and then he also has Mrs. Shaw, which was published in East Africa as We The Star, we the Scarred. Um, um, your profile says that Nairobi Heat is under option for, uh, for Hollywood stu studio. Is that correct, Nkoma? Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's correct, yep. But it takes a while, so. <laughs> it takes a while. I think Melanie, you also have something like that. Yes, yes. My mm. my first book was optioned by Hollywood Studio Two in mm. I think in 2015, and it takes a while. Yeah. Yeah, no, it does. Yeah, yeah. It does take mm. a while. So let's start with you, Melanie. Um, a, a little about you. I mean, you're you're born in Eastern Germany, and then you moved to Western Germany, and then you start your career as a journalist, and then it, and then now you're a famous author. Um, do you mind telling us a little bit about the transition from journalism to author? Yeah, of course. I'd love to. Uh, great question. I mean, I always loved books, right? I was always around books. I was always going as a kid to the library, like checking out everything I was allowed to check out. And um, But I come from a very working class background. And even though it would have been a very natural move for me to um, to think about becoming a writer, becoming a literary writer, um, that didn't even occur to me. So I went off to university after school. And I was always drawn to language and to, um, and to people and to stories. So it seemed very, um, um, very um, logical to me to become a journalist, to, to chase stories, to talk to a lot of people and to write. Um, but while I was doing that in my early 20s, I started out writing novels just um, in my free time, very early in the morning. And for a lot of time, for a very long time, I didn't show them to anyone because I was shy about it. And because I was having all those working class girl um, complexes, like, who do you think you are? You're not a writer. Da, 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 da. And um, so for quite some time, um, I'd been writing quietly by myself, um, just um, next to my job. And then very, very, very naturally, the time came for me to... Um, when I was willing to to show my work to someone and when I was developing the wish to get published. Um, and from that point on, it actually took me quite some time to find a publishing house. I had actually written four complete novels that didn't get published because I didn't find a publisher willing to do so. And um, then I've written um, The Trap, which was my official debut, my first um, psychological thriller, which um, then came out in Germany in 2015. And since it was rather successful and since the publishing house um, believed in this book very much, um, for a while I kept working as a journalist by day and writing books by night, but I ju just then made, made this switch um, to, um, to working as um, a literary author full time. And I've been doing that since, I don't know, 16, 17, a couple of years now. And well, congratulations first on, uh, 
on your book. The the trap of uh, I'm I'm seeing it won the Stuttgart Stuttgart book prize. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was really fun. A lot of good things happened with this book, um, and it in, in tell Germany. Us, tell, us it bit, like a, tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, it's um, the protagonist is um, is a young woman. Her name's Lena Conrad, and she's a best-selling author who um, who is a complete recluse um, who hasn't left her fancy villa at Starnberger See uh, next to Munich, which is a very fancy neighborhood. Who hasn't left her villa for eleven years because she's traumatized, um, and she's traumatized since um, her sister whom she loved very much, was murdered. And Linda, my protagonist, um, witnessed the murder and saw the killer fleeing the scene, but she couldn't catch him and he never got caught. And um, and she's traumatized by that. And she, um, she develops a couple of psychological issues and a lot of anxiety and depression. And she doesn't go out until 11 years later, she um, turns on the TV and she just sees the guy as a news presenter on the television. And she creates a trap to lure him into a house because she's not able to go out. Um, to um, and yeah, she's she's creating a couple of mind games for him. She lures him in with the promise of an interview. She's a recluse; she doesn't give interviews normally. And he comes to her house, and then she does stuff to him. And it, it's a very um, unbloody, non-gory thriller. It's it's very psychological. And the trap she's setting for um, for this man is a literary one. She writes a book mm -hmm. with a lot of hints about him and her sister and and, and what he presumably did. And um, and he comes to her house very early in the book. And, um, and in, in the course of the book, it's not about um, that much. Is she going to catch him and how? Um, but we we start to to doubt her and and think about is she is she even right does she even have the right guy and so it's it's like it's like this all the time between the two of them and so that's I think that's the appeal of the book that's the trap and that was my my debut yeah mm -hmm. thank you let's get Mukoma in um, Mukoma you were born in the U S you were raised in Nairobi in Kenya mm -hmm. not Nairobi in Kenya and then you moved back to the U S A. And you also had a bit of a journalistic uh, background, you know, writing for Pambamzuka and spaces like mm -hmm. that. Would you like to tell us about your transition from your writing for publications to to, mm -hmm. to, to your first published published novel? Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I was born in the U.S. Um, fifty one years ago, <laughs> to be precise. Uh, then um, yeah, then that, and I, I didn't grow up in Nairobi. I grew up in li rural Limuru. Um, then I came back for my studies when I was nineteen. So I just wanted to say quickly, most of my writing then mirrors that journey, right? You know, uh, that journey of either my characters are moving back to Kenya and dealing with issues <laughs> or coming back here and dealing with issues and so on and so forth. No, I, I was never, I, I, yeah, I, I did do a lot of journalistic stuff with Pam Bazooka, right? I also wrote for the BBC Focus on Africa magazine. For a while, I was writing a lot of political columns, but I, I, I really wouldn't call myself a journalist, right? I, I just fell into it. So with Pambazuka, I was the core editor, I think, for a year or so. Okay, with Pambazuka, I could say I did some journalistic stuff. I, you know, like, you know, I would go to places and talk with people and write about that. Um, but even then, I was always a writer, right? You know, so, you know, unlike Melanie, who, you know, who moves from, you know, who moves from journalism into in, into writing. For me, I would say I was always writing. I was, but, oh, yeah, so we, we didn't do the reverse journey where I'm coming from writing and then getting taken over by <laughs> You know, by journalism, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I was always writing. Uh, even when I, I think when I was writing, by the time I was working with Pamba Zuka, I think in 2007, I think I'd already written Mrs. Shaw, right? So I, I, at that point, I was doing journalism for a living, you could say, so I could write. Um, but, but but generally speaking, I believe in working in multiple genres anyway. Even till today, I still write political columns if there's something to be said, right? But they do influence each other, though. Uh, some of my columns will deal with the same issues of, in this case, Africans and African Americans. Mm -hmm. So, so how do you how do you get to write your first? Because um, I know Nairobi Heat was your debut. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Yeah. So, Mrs. I wrote Mrs. Shaw first. It's only that Nairobi Heat, you know, uh, Nairobi Heat came out first, right? 
Uh, so with Mrs. Shaw, it began, I had a nightmare, right? I, I had a nightmare about this guy being chased by, you know, a, a, a police from the dictatorship and witnessing a massacre. So, so that becomes the opening scene of that book, right? And then everything else follows from that. Uh, with Nairobi Heat, I consider it a found novel um, because I wouldn't have written it if this particular incident, which I'll tell you now, hadn't happened. Uh, so I was doing my PhD at uh, UW Madison, which is a big football, American football, I should add, you know, American football uh, state at school. And so they have these, they would have these big parties, you know, and one day uh, I was just coming home. Of course, I never went to those games. But anyway, I was coming home late anyway from a bar, and um, I lived on the third floor of an, of an apartment building, and I found this white woman passed out, uh, and she had a cheerleader outfit, right? You know, and she had thrown up all over the place <laughs> uh, on the stairwell. So I call an ambulance, um, but in the US, the ambulance comes with cops, so a cop arrived first anyway. So the cop who came uh, was Black American, he was African American, right? And at some point, I'm just standing there. I'm, I'm looking at the scene, if you will. <laughs> you know, there's a white woman in a cheerleader outfit. There's a black American cop, and there's an African, right? And that becomes the basis of, of Nairobi Heat, right? You know, so in Nairobi Heat, uh, in this case, the white woman is, has been killed, has been murdered, and the suspect is African, and the person investigating the crime uh, is African American. So, so I'm always fascinated by how we write. Like literally, if that hadn't happened, <laughs> I wouldn't have written a Robby Heat. I wouldn't have known how. Okay, maybe something else would have happened and I've written something different. But without without the partic without that particular incident, mm. uh, Nairobi Heat wouldn't exist. Nairobi Heat also also was trans was translated into Germany and all German mm. and also won a German award. Uh, book culture. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, um, for a while I was for a while I was hot in Germany until Melanie came along. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, yeah. So and, and actually I did have a question for Melanie because it's something that's fascinated me. Um so I yeah, so yeah, so yeah, so it did well, it did well in Germany, and consequently uh the uh the sequel also got it got got, got translated into, into German as well. But yeah, but I've always won okay, so and I know that there's a big um crime fiction reading culture in Germany, right? But I'm wondering why, like, wh like what, what is it about crime fiction? Look, like, what, what is it about German culture that finds expression uh, through crime fiction? Because I think it's very unique. At, at least I haven't seen anywhere where, you know, like crime fiction as a genre is consumed. Uh, Quite like that. Consumed, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's a good and big question. I think um, hmm, I think there's um, there's a couple of different um, aspects to that. I think one thing, and, and that would have actually been my question to you, but I'll get to that later. I think one thing is that in Germany the book market separates crime fiction much more sharply from all the rest than other book markets do. So I think. Um, it appears uh, like there's a much bigger market. Mm -hmm. um, and also I think um, this gusto for crime fiction um, has something to do with, um, I mean, this is a very psychological explanation and just, mm -hmm. um, just a theory of mine, but I feel like um, with German history and um, Germans always being very eager or at least as I perceive us, um, always being very eager to to look at the darker sides of our past and the darker mm -hmm. parts within ourselves. Um, it seems very logical to me to be drawn to something that is dark mm -hmm. as well in literature and that has a resolution in the mm -hmm. end, which is mm -hmm. very, um, very satisfying. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think in general, um, with um, more crises piling up right now, mm. with climate crisis and everything else, um, I at first thought crime fiction might become less successful and people might mm. turn to escape, other forms of escapism more. But mm. nowadays, I think um, it will blossom and bloom even more, at least in Germany, mm. because um, people love so much to confront themselves mm. with dark themes, but then have this perfect and neat resolution in the end, where there's mm. 
bow and 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 everything is mm -hmm. resolved in a in a satisfying way i think, I think mm -hmm. maybe that's it mm -hmm. yeah I don't know how how do you perceive your market, mm -hmm. um, the Kenyan market and the market in the U.S. for crime fiction? Mm -hmm. So, so in in regard to Germany, I have a similar theory because um, Nairobi hit Nairobi hit deals with the Rwanda genocide, right? You know, so and for me, I always thought the reason why it did well there because it, it almost not necessarily escaped, in, but it becomes a way of of dealing with the Holocaust without necessarily you know, dealing with it. I don't know, <laughs> right? You know, so, um, well, with the American market, so with, with the American market, the NRB hit was marketed, was more like literary crime fiction, mm -hmm. right? Whereas in Germany, it was just crime fiction, right? So here there was that element of, of uh, it's literary crime fiction. Um, in Kenya... Mm -hmm. In Kenya, there is, a, there is a long culture and tradition of reading popular of popular fiction. So it just fell right in. It just fell into that. Um, you know, in fact, with Nairobi, I dedicated I dedicated it to uh, to two popular fiction writers, David Mailu and Major Mwangi, right? So, so in, in that regard, it just fell into it. It just fell into into that. Yeah, yeah. And do you mind just telling me what lit literary crime fiction means? What is that? Well, so okay, so. I, 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 Okay, that's a tough question uh, because, <laughs> because I wrote it as crime fiction, right? Uh, yeah. But I think part of it is, I think part of it is biography, right? You know, um, you know, I, I think part of it because sometimes we read we read books through a person's biography, right? You know, so they are, they are you know, scholarly, okay, quote unquote, scholarly. Um, there are elements of or flares of, you know, for example, there is a character who is a poet. Right. Um, I don't know use of metaphors. I'm not sure. Like I can't explain. <laughs> you know, well, but it's, 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 the, it's the people. It's the people who are doing the categorizing who put it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's the people who are doing the categor categorizing who put it that way. But for me, really, I was writing a tradition of um, of um, you know, of, of of the Kenyan popular popular authors. Though, 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 on the other hand, though, though okay, okay. Let me put it this way, right? So I think with the sort of crime fiction we write, we carry heavy issues as well, right? You know, so with Nairobi Heat, there's a question of genocide, as I mentioned. There's a question of Africans and African Americans, questions of identity, questions of gender, and so on and so forth. But, okay, this is gonna be a long-winded explanation, but okay, we have a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. So if you compare the sort of fiction, crime fiction that let's say a person like, um, uh, I have him here, Walter Mosley, devil in a blue dress right as a black writer like you have to bring those issues right whereas if you compare him to a person like raymond chandler he can just write white white crime where you know we're supposedly <laughs> we're supposedly it's just about crime so so i think by definition people writing from from outside people writing from the other side let me put it that way whether it's gender sexuality uh or, or identity and so on and so forth by definition Will carry those issues, and hence it will appear as literary, literary crime fiction. I, I you mentioned a, a bit about the Kenyan tradition of writing crime, mm -hmm. and uh, we we have somebody who I mean she's German, and I'm sure that some of the audience are German. Um, mm -hmm. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that that uh, mm -hmm. literary tradition of writing crime? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, okay, this is my theory, right? Um, so when when the more serious writers, you know, are detained or exiled. Right, the literary types. Um, it's actually the, the popular fiction writers who kept the politics alive in their novels, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at um, a person like David Milo, Major Mwangi, David Roheni, right? Um, even though they're writing popular fiction, or, or John Kariamete for that matter, right? Where it's a memoir of, of, of doing crime. So for him, it's literary, <laughs> it's literal, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you read those books, you find they're talking about joblessness. They're they making a critique of neo-colonial Kenya, joblessness, corruption, uh, where, you know, moving from, this, from, from the village to the city and getting corrupted by it, and so on and so forth. So in a way, in a way they feel that vacuum. And we as readers then, and we as readers then uh, welcome that. And, and we devoured, we devoured those books. Um, in, in school, in secondary school, it wasn't surprising to see somebody like holding a book of Shakespeare, but in between, uh, they have these little pamphlets. I don't know what to call them, like chap, I will call them chap books, right, by David Milo, <laughs> you know, because that's what we are reading, right? Anyway, yes. 
So I, 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 th I think they fulfilled a very important role in, in keeping us reading, but also keeping us informed of the day's politics without, 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 a, without, a, without, without being, without coming to the attention of the government. Um, the Melody, when I was, thank you. Melody, you know, when I Google like the top crime writers in Germany, I, I, I didn't see any white, any, anybody that looked like you. Yeah. Um, I imagine. First of all, tell me a bit about the scene there and your, your space in that scene. Yeah. I mean, um, it's uh, it's a large scene because it's Germany and it's 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 a large country of many readers, but it's also a small scene. And most of I would say I've been on the market since I've been on the market for seven years, and most of them I know. And um, there are other crime writers of color, of course, but not that many. And mm. I mean, there's always this big discussion in, in Germany whether or not we are a country of immigrants. And obviously we are. But um, there's there's um, there's more and more diversity when it comes to, um, to the publishing world and people are paying more attention to these matters. But it's, I mean, compared to other countries, I think it's a relatively new phenomenon. And it's not a rare occur uh, occurrence for me to um, step into a room in publishing and be the only person of color by far. And um, that's actually, is changing. And I see more and more people coming in and obviously um, all of the, the social movements and everything that's been happening in the last couple of years. Um, we take note of that in Germany too, not just me or people of color like me, but, um, but a lot of other people in publishing. And um, but it's slow process. It's a slow process. So I think it's very different um, in the US and obviously it's very different in Kenya too. So, but um, to me, the market has always been rather friendly and um, yeah, I actually enjoy publishing in Germany and I enjoy publishing in Germany, not just because it's this big market and people are buying a lot of books, but because um, my voice being a black German author um, is is um, is rather unique by default, you know, mm -hmm. so that's 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 an interesting role. Um, and first of all, I say thank you, Lucas Wafula. He's uh, in the room. He's just commented. Thank you for mm. commenting on our live stream. Um, I hope you are still there enjoying our conversation. Um, uh, Melanie, it's not that just that you're a woman of uh, that a person of color, but you're a woman. Is it like a? Is there something there you want to talk to? Yeah, I mean. Um... There's a lot of female, very uh, popular crime writers in Germany um, who are doing very different kinds of books. We have um, what what I would call in German Schmunzelkrimi, which is um, which is a type of crime writing that is very light and funny. And we have a lot mm -hmm. of female authors who are doing that. We have a lot of um, psychological authors. We have a lot of female um, crime writers really winning big prizes. Um, so it might seem like uh, gender is not as much an issue as anything else. But um, there's been um, still a big discussion in Germany about, um, about who wins, um, not just who, who sells the books, but who, who wins the prizes, who wins the awards. Mm -hmm. And people have actually been counting um, the number of women who, who mm -hmm. actually win big prizes and who are in, in the juries who give the prize to people. And there's um, there's obviously um, still, the scale is still tipping um, towards mm -hmm. the male authors a lot. But other than that, um, the audience is overwhelmingly female. The buyers mm -hmm. are overwhelmingly female and many many of the successful authors are actually female mm -hmm. uh mukoma i mean i mm -hmm. you know the the nairobi hit had a su sequel uh mm -hmm. killing star sahara black star nairobi i mm -hmm. mean melanie's books are standalone they just go she does one book move to the next one mm -hmm. uh, how, how does the sequel come about for you mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah, so my plan had been to write three, <laughs> and they're called three quail. Um, no, first I wanted to, 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 to talk a little bit about what Melanie was saying, because it's a, it's a similar thing here with black authors, right? The counting, right? And uh, at, some, at some point on Twitter, there was this, um, I forget the hashtag now, but where white Publishing authors- paid. Be, uh, Publishing paid me. Yeah, 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 publisher what? paid me, right? Yeah, where people mm. would say, white authors would say, this is what they got. Then a more successful black author would be like, well, <laughs> they receive much, much less, you know? So, but, but hopefully there's an awakening. Um, okay, writing a sequel. Yeah, so I'd say I plan to write, uh, my plan had been to write three of them, uh, but I'm stuck on the third one. So there's that, right? <laughs> mm. Yeah, but my plan, yeah, because I never really saw myself as a crime fiction writer, but now, but I do enjoy the genre and so on and so forth. Um, when, when I wrote Nairobi Heat, I wasn't planning, at that point I wasn't planning on a, uh, on, on a sequel, right? And I killed off some characters that I really shouldn't have, right? That <laughs> 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 yeah. was terrible. I was so sad. <laughs> so because when I was writing the sequel, I was like, why, why did I kill that character? But, but, but part of it is, I, I think there has to be like political events happening, right? You know, so, so with, with Nairobi hit, it was the, the Rwandan genocide, right? Uh, and then the, the post electoral violence in Kenya happened in 2007. So and I was like, okay, what would happen if, if I amass my characters, these same characters? Like, what if I amass them in the, in the post electoral violence and the politics that followed? Um, so I guess I'm waiting for, for more political violence to erupt before I write the, <laughs> I write the third one. <laughs> no, but, but, it's, but, but you tend also to fall in love with your characters, right? You know, as you move along the way, as, and, and also as they grow. And, and also, for me, the, it, it, it's growing as, growing as a writer as I work through the same characters, right, over and over again. Um, and one was, you know, Nairobi hit is full of coincidences. So I learned from that, <laughs> you know, and then consequently corrected that in, uh, in Blacks and Nairobi. But, but I don't have a formula. You know, I, I just sit down and start writing, which is probably not the best process. But, you know, but when it works, it works well. When it doesn't, then you don't write, you know, there isn't. <laughs> you know? Melanie, what about you? Are there any, any, any thoughts on the sequel system? I mean, are we getting a trap sequel? Or that, are you also killed yeah. everyone? <laughs> I killed everyone. No, um, I, it 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 really made me laugh so hard when you just said that we we make mistakes and some of them we can correct and others we can. So if you just kill yeah. the character, it's no correcting yeah. that. And that's so that's so funny to me. But mm -hmm. I um I really enjoyed uh, listening um, talking you, to you about your writing process because my process is um, mm -hmm. is rather similar. And um, before I tell you something about it, I would like to ask um, your professor, right? So you don't mm -hmm. write full time. You have to um, find mm -hmm. find um, find mm -hmm. time to write. Um, what is the ideal time, or you, or mm -hmm. do you tr try to um, like go away mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks and then sit down to write? Um, how do you mm -hmm. do that? Yeah, in in, in Gekoyo, we would call it you do though, right? Which I'm not sure how it translates into like uh you know like people who don't ever play soccer or football right and they just kick the ball around and <laughs> yeah. yeah no but um but I, I, what i found is like everything informs each other right you know so for example uh nairobi heat it's about africans and african americans right and thinking through that then end up teaching about uh teaching a, a teacher course on africans and african americans and then thinking through that now the book i'm working on uh, is is the relationship between Africans and African Americans via slavery? So it, it's more, it's more literary, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think for me, I let them. I, I think I, I let them have this symbiotic relationship. So so I don't divide, right? You know, so mm -hmm. one thing will lead to the other one, or both, or, or they will bleed into each other. Um, I don't have an ideal time. You know, usually, usually when, when when okay when. Okay, well, fine, what they call the flow. <laughs> okay, when it comes, then I'll just write until, you know, I'll just disappear into that world. And, and sometimes, sometimes it will be at the expense of other things as well, you know. But, but, generally, it, but generally, all the different things I do, the teaching, uh, the more scholarly stuff, you know, the, lit the, the literary writing, the crime fiction, the columns, they, they all sort of flow, flow together. But, um, but, but I think part of it is coming from an African literary tradition where indeed uh, the writers like Chinua Chebe 
you know, in that generation, they did everything as well, right? They wrote poetry, they did commentary, they did reviews. You know, it's almost like, I don't know, it's almost like a hunger, actually, or gluttony. <laughs> Maybe a better word is gluttony. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but, 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 but I think coming from a, an African literary tradition, there's that whole idea that, um, that you have to do everything. But I don't know, and maybe James, you can speak to this. I don't know if the younger writers have that same sort of, if the younger, if the younger African writers now can sort of specialize, where they just say, "I'm doing fiction and that's it," or "I'm doing poetry and that's it," you know. But but our literary tradition has been, well, if a poem comes to you, you write it, you know. But I have to say, a lot of that poetry was terrible. <laughs> 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 okay, <laughs> you know, like Chinua Achebe's poetry. I mean, come on. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but but okay, maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> but but that's why but that's our literary tradition as well, like writing through all these multiple, working through all these multiple genres. Yeah. Mm. Okay, Melanie, to you. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I, I think it's um, it's a privilege to be uh, to be to be mm. able to write in different genres and um, just um, mm. just do a bunch of different writing. I think for me in Germany, it would have been much harder to. Um, there was a point in time when I when I thought um, I can never write anything else but a psychological thriller because my audience mm -hmm. will be disappointed if I do, mm -hmm. and I had, had become sort of a specialist. And then I'd written mm -hmm. then I've written a book on creativity, and nonfiction work, and yeah, then well. I've written a small essay on um, on popular culture mm -hmm. and pop music, and now I've written um, a literary novel. And actually. Um, not just my publishing house, but also my audience really got that. So mm -hmm. I can really relate to what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. And I feel the same way about it. And I think um, it's um, writing and thinking and reading very broadly is always a good thing for all the work mm -hmm. one's doing. And when it comes to uh, when it comes to process and writing, um, my process is super chaotic. I just um, mm -hmm. write and try to get in flow, just like you said. And then I yeah. cut away everything that's not good, and then mm -hmm. I do it again. And it's a lot of trial and error for me. So that's mm -hmm. how I work. And I must say, when I was um, still working as a journalist, a lot of hours by day, um, mm -hmm. it still took me about two years to finish a novel. Mm. And now I'm only writing my books mm. and it still takes me two years. So oh. there's, uh, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but my brain just um, mm. take, takes this amount of time to come up with a story mm. and to make it rich and to, to draw from reality and my dreams and my psyche. And um, mm. so, yeah. Mm. I'm, I'm going to ask you the, the show me the money question. I'll start with you, Melanie, because you're the one in the in the, in the trenches. Um, mm. I'm, are we in a position where you can actually make a living from this space? Like you don't have to do many other mm -hmm. things. You don't have to be, uh, I'm a crime fiction writer and I also need to sell insurance on the side. Um, mm -hmm. is, is this something that's- Do you need one? Do you need one, <laughs> I, I you need insurance? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah. I actually, I'm, I'm very lucky because I can. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think it's like uh, like a mixed calculation. I'm um, my first book was translated in a lot of languages, as as you said before, mm -hmm. and um, and Germany is a big market, and and we always mm -hmm. um, and we also publish obviously in in Austria and the German speaking part of Switzerland, even mm -hmm. if those markets are much smaller. And um, and then I sell um, to to other countries, or my publishing house sells my book to other countries, and I have movie rights. But mm -hmm. even without that, right now I would be able to um, to live comfortably mm -hmm. off uh, of the money my books are making. Mm -hmm. And um, knock on wood for it to stay that way. But right mm -hmm. now I can. But actually in Germany, um, when I go to um, to festivals or Frankfurt Book Fair and meet other writers. Or just read about uh, what other people are saying. It's um, I've forgotten the number, but I read the number about how many writers, not not specifically crime writers, but how many writers do have no jobs, and um, and the number of those just living off their novels is mm -hmm. in a very low. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's two percent. Uh, um, it, it's a very low number, so um, mm. it's very common for people to have other jobs. 
Mm. Most of them, man, many, many of them are journalists or writing other stuff on the side. Mm. Um, Nkoma, I know you're you're not living in the in, Nairo, in Kenya right now, but uh, mm. you you are studying us as well. Um, so maybe mm. you you want to speak to the same question. Show me the money. Yeah, um, no, I wanted to say like German was is very interesting to me because I remember the first time I went to give a talk, uh, a reading at a bookstore, and I got paid, and I was shocked. Like literally, I was like, "What is this?" Like, yeah, because in the U.S., you know, they, you just go to a bookstore, you do your reading, then you go home. You know, like they don't pay you. Oh no, my God. they don't. Yeah, I, you oh. see the shock. <laughs> that, that was my shock as well. That, that was the shock when I got paid. So, so I mean, I, 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 I think there might be more respect for 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 writing as labor in Germany than here, right? You know, that, if we go to the bookstore. Um, no, but in, in the US, you have to be a bestseller, you know, or have multiple bestsellers to make a living as, as a writer. So, um, so I think most of us will have day jobs, as, as Melanie said. Uh, and also, I, I think a lot of us teach, either you're teaching writing or, you, you know, you, a, a, lot, a lot of writers are teaching MFAs or doing workshops. Like, like you, you have to have side gigs unless you are, you are very, very successful. So, so in my okay. case, I, you know, like I, I make most of my living from teaching, really. Otherwise, uh, I would literally be a starving artist, you know. I, I want to know what is this? What is this about Germany that uh, that mm. that's so special? Because I mean, you're paying people when you go and do readings. What's the story mm. there? I mean, why does Germany, the country, do that? Oh, I'm I'm actually not sure. Um... I mean, if if you're asking Germans like like me, we always complain, right? It's a very German yeah. thing to complain. And so I just have to wrap my head around the fact that we actually got it better than, than anybody else because you complain all the time. <laughs> and um, but I think there's um, there's a big appreciation not just for the arts in general, but for books. And we have what we call Buchpreisbindung, which means that yeah. books cost the same amount of money no matter where you buy them. It's actually for oh, yeah, yeah. sale. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so many things about books are very protected in Germany by, um, by, uh, by politics. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I guess that's why, um, why authors are paid when they do readings because people are actually um, willing to um, to buy tickets for that, and um, and comparing uh, what I know about other countries from from traveling abroad and doing uh, book tours there, in Germany we have a different culture of. Um, I think it's rather unique that we actually sit down and we don't just do a book signing or a quick talk with someone, but we actually read long passages from the book and the audience looks at us, listens to us. So it's like this big yeah. performance aspect to um, to presenting your book. And um, and yeah, we should get paid for that. You should get paid for that too in the US. Uh, no, yeah, so, but you're right, like... Okay. So okay, so the long readings. Um, so of course I'm, I'm writing in English, right? You know, so so yeah, there's that whole performance thing where they will get an actor who will come and read these long passages, right? And so, but for me, I'm like, <laughs> you know, because they're reading in German and you, you just start. You so so if you if so my passage is like five minutes, and then the the actor's passage is like forty five minutes or one hour. <laughs> so you just sit there. <laughs> no, but no, but no, but it's great. though, it's great. Uh, but also, I think there isn't, um, yeah, as you mentioned, right? I, like Amazon has to sell at the same price as the yeah. as a bookstore, so you cannot undercut the bookstores and so on and so forth. So, so, so it's a protected market. Um, yeah, but certainly in the US, we should have that culture. Um, you know, I, I think it's cultural where here um, a writing is seen more, okay, let me put it badly, as a hobby, right? You know what I mean? It's, it's not seen as labor, it's not seen as. Mm -hmm. As labor that deserves compensation, right? So even when you get invited to festivals and so on and so forth, right? You know, you, you expect it. Okay, fine. Sometimes you'll get paid, but you expect it to do it for free, right? But part of it could be also there is no money, right? But now I'm wondering, like, how how Zoom? At least what I'm noticing in the US is because of like Zoom made everything even more cheaper, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Where people realize now you can have authors, you know, um, you know, via Zoom, and then you know. And, and then not even actually pay them because it seems you're just chilling at home, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to people thinking, well, 
now that you don't have to pay for air tickets, you don't have to pay for hotels and all that stuff. Like, why can't we pay them more, right? So I don't know. So at any rate, it's 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 a, it's a weird culture that we have here, I think. Um, um, but again, but, but, but I would say, uh, please finish. You know, yeah, but I wanted to say, like, on the other hand, for myself, like, I don't know if I can be a full-time writer. Like, I don't know what I would do, you know, because I love the teaching, you know, I love, you know, the ideas, the theories, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I wish I had the option, though, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's not by choice. So if I had the option, maybe I would do it, yeah. Uh, Lucas, thank you so much. He's uh, Lucas commenting that younger African writers still try to do everything, but he finds them less passionate, so some give up easily. Which have which have experienced. Um, many many young writers will give up quite quite early uh, mm. before they build the discipline and the, and the craft and the body of work that allows them to to be recognized mm. out there. So, uh, do you guys have any questions for each other before we continue? Oh, I, I have a question, if I may. Um, mm. As as a crime writer. Um, do you how, how much attention do you pay to the rules mm -hmm. of genre and did you mm -hmm. um did you just learn per osmosis by reading a lot of crime fiction mm -hmm. or do you actually think about oh okay um if this is uh, is if this is going to be a crime novel this mm -hmm. must happen and and this part i must not forget mm -hmm. and this must be in there or do you just um write yeah, so with Nairobi Heat, I think I, I, I didn't I, I didn't have a good idea what I was doing, you know. So, so that one I would say it was it was through osmosis, right? But but even then, having read a lot of, of crime fiction and popular fiction, you understand it's a genre, right? You know, so at least with with, with crime fiction, then you know, like you know, you need a femme fatale, you know, you need a you need a jaded anti-hero, then you need your protagonist, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so and, and and so and and then I started to think of it as a sonnet. You know, the, the fun of writing a sonnet is actually knowing the rules, and then, you know, you can break them, of course, if you want. But but doing things within, you know, within the structure of a sonnet. So I think the same thing with crime fiction, right? We can, we, we have this genre, and then, then 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 the 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 task for our imagination is, 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 is to see what we can do with it. Um, but okay, so after I wrote Nairobi Heat. Um, I was invited somewhere to do a popular a popular fiction workshop, right? And of course, I had no idea, right? You know, so so I looked around, um, and I came across uh, they are, they are set on Hall University in um, in New Jersey, where they actually teach. They have an MFA in popular fiction. So I emailed the professor there, and she was kind enough to send me um, the, her workshop notes or whatever you know her workshop that she uses. And when I read it, I was like, damn, okay, I really messed up. <laughs> I really messed up this year. <laughs> so, because that's when I learned about, uh, you know, because for her, you know, that's what she studies, right? You know, so, so some of the things I learned, which I, which I didn't use anyway, but it, it, interesting to think about. Uh, like you need a, an aha moment for the, where the, where the reader discovers before the detective what's going to happen, right? And that's, that's the satisfaction for the, for the, uh, you know, for for the reader. Then the other one was you can't have too many coincidences because because it becomes unbelievable. Yeah. So yeah. So so it it but it is a genre, right? And the fun of it is working within it, right? And trying to do different things with it. Okay, I return the same question to you then. Ah, um, mm. I don't really pay attention to it. Um, mm. Which um, yeah. Which, it might be the reason why um, the four, the first four books I've written mm -hmm. weren't picked up by any publisher because mm -hmm. it was a weird mix between um, mm -hmm. thriller and something completely different. Mm -hmm. um, but still now I'm um, I think still now it's it's debatable whether mm -hmm. a book like The Trap is actually crime fiction and a thriller or something mm -hmm. else. And um, I just try to make it, um, I just try to create as much suspense as possible mm. with the means I have, but I don't think mm. about um, elements that have to be in there. And I like to switch it up and create something mm. new just for my fantasy. And um, mm. and actually it's funny because my first book, The Trap, the one we, we, we talked about earlier, mm. when it mm. came out as, as a hardcover book, like, mm. um, is that the word? Hardcover? Yeah. Mm. Hardcover book. Um, 
the the publishing house um, had my name, mm -hmm. the title, and Roman, which is the German mm -hmm. word for novel. And when it oh. came out back mm -hmm. two years mm -hmm. later, um, mm -hmm. the novel didn't sell that well. Mm -hmm. So um, the marketing team of the publishing house decided um, mm -hmm. it might be a novel, but it also might be a thriller. And they on the paperback version they put a uh, thriller. Mm -hmm. under the under the title and sold much better which is how i became a thriller writer mm -hmm. i used to be novelist before <laughs> it's oh, just yeah. <laughs> vision, right yeah. and um so i don't pay that much attention to genre as sometimes think i should mm -hmm. but now i'm too far too far gone into the other direction and now i feel mm -hmm. i might jinx my writing if i mm. start paying attention to genre rules now so i don't think mm. i ever will mm -hmm. um so so you read in german mm -hmm. yeah all right so then is a question about translation then do you like how do you work with your translators like are you a hands-on translator let's say in english of course uh, yeah or do, you, or do you or do you see translators as as their own authors where they can play around with the text or with the novel or in the thriller? Yeah, um, my English translator is the only one I'm really in contact with because it's mm -hmm. the only language I can read well enough to mm -hmm. um, to understand nuance. Mm -hmm. um, and I read and I speak a bit of French and Spanish, but not, not enough to, to mm -hmm. have discussion with a translator. Um, and I just, um, I just step in if she needs me or asks me something. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I just let her be and let her do her job and i'm very happy with my translator mm. um i i see them as um as artists in their own right mm. but i i have to be honest i wouldn't appreciate them um changing up too much or <laughs> too creative with my work um but um yeah it's an interesting topic i actually just had lunch with a translator who mm. translates um a lot of books from english to german mm. and um knowing a couple of translators um makes me very um mm. makes me feel very calm giving my work into their hands because i know how um how much mm. thought they put into really getting it right mm. and not just the right words and the right vibe, mm. but the right rhythm. And it's it's um, mm. it's crazy complicated work. Mm. Um, I don't know how, do you work with any translators? Do you follow that process or? Yeah, so so in, in theory, in theory, I, I think of translators, as you said, like, like collaborators, right? Or, mm. you know, and I, for me, it would be okay if they had Within the text, creative license, right? But because the translator, the translators I've worked with, we, I, I don't speak to that. I've, I haven't been translating to that many languages: German, French, and Turkish, I think. You know, and I don't speak any of them. Yeah. You know, so but I do enjoy the, but I do enjoy the care with which they approach the text. You know, like, what did you mean by this specific word? Is this what you meant? Right? Yeah. So so they they do take tremendous care, right? Um, but then, of course, the problem is translators, they don't, if writers don't get paid well, you know, translators are paid much less as well, right? Mm. Yeah. Because, I don't know, because it's some, somehow it's seen as a, less, as, a lesser, as, a, as a lesser art form. You know, and in the USA, there's a crisis of translation as well, where, you know, you know Americans can be very parochial, <laughs> you know, so, so there's that, yeah. Huh? I mean, Nukoma, your, your, your books have not been translated into any African languages. What do you feel about that? Yeah, so yeah, well, how, 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 what do I feel about writing in English? <laughs> you know, mm. you know um, so, it, okay, so the, it's a very layered question. The first, the first one is, it's like for me to have books published in the, in the, in the US and then not, not appear in the African market. You know, and I was going to ask you the, the question of audience, Melanie, right? You know, like who's your audience? You know, because for me, I do consider my audience primarily um, African and African American, Black American, and then from there, then it can it, it, it can it can become concentric, right? It can do the circle can widen. So, so the books not appearing anywhere in the continent that 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 that's painful for my imagination. And then even for the rise of the African novel, which is a scholarly work on on the African literary tradition, like I had to I had to have the the publisher have in their contract that they will make sure they will give the files to African publishers and that's how the book ended up there. So that's one then, so that, that's just on the availability of the books. Uh, the question of language. 
So I'm trying to move, I'm, I'm trying to translate Nairobi heat into Gekoyo, right? Uh, because it, it, it feels, you know, and I haven't gone very far, but, but it, it does feel like that. Uh, there's this thing from Ole Shoinka when he's play, uh, the King's Horse, what is it called? The King's something, something. Was translated into Yoruba where somebody said, aha, the book has finally come home, right? So I do feel if, if I can get my books translated into Gekoyo, there's the ways in which they'll be returning home. Um, but this is, it, it's, it's a huge problem, right? It's so I also, I co-founded the Kiswahili Praise, right? Uh, where, the, where the question becomes, okay, the books have appeared in Kiswahili. Can we get them translated into other African languages or European languages and so on and so forth? So I would say maybe even beyond worrying about what language I'm writing in, I think the field to grow is translation, right? We, we need to see translation as a viable as a viable way, right? And think about different ways of translating. Are we translating from African languages into European languages, or vice versa, or intra-African languages? And what kind of theories emerge from that? Okay, that's, mm. that's a long way to say I'm troubled. <laughs> <laughs> You do sound troubled. Um, <laughs> Melanie, I'm going to flip it up a bit. Um, I was watching your, 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 what do you call it? Your TED talk mm. on, uh, on creativity. And uh, you, you speak about anybody can be creative in a specific yes. way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why it's not become a, a, a I don't know why it doesn't have a million views. You want to start a chat a bit about that because you've actually written a book about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would actually love to talk about that. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, the book came to be because of a podcast I had started with a friend of mine who um, who is actually um, in Germany a very famous... A, she's, she's a TV presenter, but she's also um, a YouTuber and designer. She builds stuff with her own hands. Um, she invents things and builds them in her own um, work works um, workshop. That's the word, workshop. And um, we, um, we've known each other from school, and we were always spending our lunch breaks together, talking about our um, respective um, creative processes. And I was working very abstractly, always um, typing away, making stuff up in my own head. And she's working with her hands and with wood and with metal. And um, and we we realized that we actually have a lot of this the a lot of very similar problems to solve, um, even though the um, the way we are creative is very different. And so we thought it, it might be interesting to um, to put these talks into um in a more structured conversational form um as a podcast so we did that and we were talking about creativity and all the aspects of it how do you come up with ideas and inspiration and discipline and productivity and everything um in a very unpretentious manner i think because sometimes in germany talking about creativity and art can be very highbrow and we didn't do that and we tried to um, democratize those things. And my publishing house picked up on that and asked me to write a book about it, which I did, which was a very lovely process just to, um, to really dig into all the research about um, neuroscience of creativity and how the brain works and what creativity actually is. And what it is, is a tool that, that you can um, make a painting um like uh, like leonardo da vinci but it can also be a tool to um to create a dinner party where, where everybody feels comfortable or mm -hmm. to um to i don't know write a book and um yeah it opened up a lot of doors for me to write nonfiction for the first time and it's been a very pleasurable process to um to see creativity bloom and after in, in people who had, who had read the book, um, who had thought they weren't creative at all, and um, at times are in uh, in creative jobs now because of that. And so that's been really fun. Yeah, and a lot of people think they're not creative because at school or um, through media, we are under the impression that only artists are creative. Mm -hmm. and 
obviously not everybody's an artist, but there's so many different forms and creativities, problem solving and communicating and a lot of stuff we do on a daily basis. So that was a very satisfying project to work on. Uh, it's in German, is it? Is there any it's chance? In German. It's not been translated yet, mm -hmm. but hopefully it uh, it will be soon. No, I like um, that a lot. Actually, the, the idea of the idea of creativity as a democratic, you know, like it's a, dem a democratic space where anybody can be creative. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, Mkoma, do you have any in about uh, uh, coming projects that you need us to know about? Uh, then you know, like any new projects coming? Um, just just the book I've been working on now for the last four years. <laughs> you know, the one on uh, on Africans and African Americans, and um, yeah, and the the relationship between the two which I argue in the book is mediated by racism, um, but it's becoming more like a travel, like a travel log into different black spaces, right? You know, so I've been to the slave, to the slave castles in Ghana, um, you know, in Kenya, I, was in, I went to Fort Jesus, I've been to, yeah, to all sorts, to, I was in Jamaica, you know, so I've, yeah, I was in Portugal, like looking at, looking for Vasco da Gama, <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, so, so it's becoming interesting to me. Um, but um, but maybe I can tell you the most startling thing that I've come across, you know. In yes, all please. These. please. Yeah, so in the, in the slave castles in Ghana, you'd have the slave dungeons at the, at the bottom, you know, then you'd have a church on top, right? You know, literally, there, there's no, it's not even a metaphor at that point, right? It's literally, you have a dungeon, and then you have a church on top, you know, and then on top of that, you have this big hall where they would have dances or, you know, or, or traders would get together, I don't know, to trade. Then on top of that, you'd have the, um, you know, the governor's, you know, the governor's quarters. But for me, the startling thing is that immediate, no sense of irony relationship between um, between slavery and, and and religion and Christianity. Mm, mm, mm. That is that is awful. Um, um, I'll just say, Melanie, do you have any projects we need to know about that are coming? Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm working on another nonfiction book right now. But right after that, I'm going to start on my next novel. And um, the novel that just came out, it's not been translated yet. It's called in German "Die Kunst des Verschwindens," which would translate to "The Art of Disappearing." And um, it's my first novel that works with elements of suspense, but also some mm. magical realism. So it was a bit more experimental than what I did before. And I think my next novel will be um, like that too. I really enjoy mixing, mixing genres right mm. now and taking some pieces from crime writing and some pieces from psychological thriller and some mm. pieces from magical realism, which I enjoy a lot and which I feel um, with the world changing quickly and, um, and, 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 and seeming out of mm. um, out of bounds in a way at times, at least um, to me, um, I feel like mixing up mm. magical elements and realistic elements is a very fitting way to try to grasp what it feels to be alive right now, at least um, mm. in my skin and in my shoes. So that's mm. what's up next for me. Would you, would you consider coming to the continent to do you, uh, your, your book, book promotion? Anytime soon? I would love that. Actually, I'm I'm going to um, I'm going to Ghana in um, I think in March or April, and maybe to Benin. Um, so far away from Kenya, but at least on the continent. And we'll see. I'm always happy to get invited. I love to travel and I love to meet new people and exchange perspectives. And so, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mukoma, you've just finished a tour of Kenya, so I'm assuming you're you're mm. you're, you're you're used to the place. You're, you're used to coming to the continent. Well, yeah, but still, an invitation wouldn't hurt. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I, I might be coming. <laughs> yeah, no, I might be coming to to Tanzania for the Kiswahili uh, Kiswahili Prize Awards in the uh, end of January. But but I'm also feeling traveled out actually because I've been on the move since I think May. But um. Mm. But of course we say that and then you rest for like two, three weeks, then you're like, yeah, gotta go. But uh, <laughs> I, we're running out of time. I, I did have one question, but I wouldn't have time to address. No, no, just so, ask the question. Uh -huh. All right, so I think the last time I was in Germany, in West Germany, okay, where was West Germany? Somebody was telling me they can still tell the difference between 
was Germans and is Germans, sometimes by language. Is that still the case? That was like four years ago. Oh, yeah, that's still very much the case. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm from the eastern part, but I've um, lived in, in the western mm -hmm. part of Germany since I was eight years old. So I don't have a dialect or an accent or anything. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's very unpopular opinion, but it's very true that um, the two parts are still very much divided and not just with with language but also in politics and mm. all the right-wing movements in germany are much stronger in the east than in the west mm. and uh, mm. there are big uh, cultural differences there and um but i think i feel it's normal because um it takes more than three or four decades for a country to really grow together mm -hmm. again so there's still yes. a lot of work to do but i feel you're right so um mm. yeah eastern germany is, is still in parts feels different from mm. from the western germany but obviously the countryside still also feels very different from mm. big towns the big cities okay that's true. yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah mm. yeah thank you so much um, i'm gonna say goodbye to the audience uh, uh, to those of you who joined us and who will be joining us in future, thank you for making it up this way. And thank you, Melanie and Mukoma, for taking part. My pleasure. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for having us. Yep. <laughs>